The Andy Poland Show. We got to go after this with everything we got, thinking they're going to come with everything they got. I'll start off by saying I'm bored, I'm broke, and I'm back. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630 starts right now. Spare me a weather minute, will you? Supposed to be 58 degrees today in the 60s next week. Now, the weather people on TV are some of the nicest people. Sue Palka is an angel. She's retired now from TV, but uh, at one time was the number one weather person in the area. And uh, she's a lovely person, but they're all wrong. I mean, this was supposed to be a winter. I know we're not out of the woods. We still got another month here where we could get pounded. But we've had one yeah, snow, right? Nothing really serious. Nothing that kept you out of work for days and days and Maybe you got the kids off from school for three or four days or even a week. No, no, it's it's been it's been a mild winter. And again, you know, we still have time because I remember, geez, 30 years ago, I think it was uh, March of 93. We had a big, big blizzard. So it can still happen. But as I continue to look at these long range forecasts and by long range, I mean a week, it's nothing happening. It's like early spring. So, um. You know, uh, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, you know, in, in what I do, sometimes make predictions, often wrong, but I'm not in the prediction business. The weather people are paid to look at the models and make predictions. And yes, things can change and they could be wrong, but they have been spectacularly wrong and good because I don't like snow anymore. I'm not in school waiting for the superintendent of schools to call off school so you know i gotta go to work and schlep through the snow so it's uh it's been good good all right uh let's move on to something else and by something else i mean who's going to be the quarterback that the commanders take am i going to make a bold prediction here and be spectacularly wrong perhaps or i might be right Um, There's a lot of noise about Caleb Williams and the Cliff Kingsbury connection and how they're going to be able to move up and how maybe because Caleb Williams has not hired an agent, this is a passive aggressive move to try and get his rights traded from Chicago to Washington where he's from. I don't know. But uh, let's let Tim Legler weigh in on this. Uh, Legler, if you don't know, uh, he grew up in Baltimore. And somewhere along the line became a Washington football team fan. He, he knows the NBA, but he knows an awful lot about football, too. And I didn't know this. He's a season ticket holder, has been a season ticket holder. I think he lives in Florida, but he's back and forth so much between New York, and he often sits in with Scott Van Pelt here in D.C. So he's back often enough. Married to, by the way, a former Eagles cheerleader. So that probably makes things interesting. Uh, when Washington plays Philadelphia. But uh, he was on one of these get-up shows yesterday, and uh, this is his prediction as to who Washington will take at number two. Drake May is going to be picked at two, okay? the law I trust the law firm of Peters, Kingsbury, and Quinn. Okay. Okay. They're going to select Drake May if he's available at two. So this is all nice move up to three to get him. I'm listening to what my man Tim Hasselbeck said about Drake May. Mm. I'm all in on Drake May. I've heard too many things about Caleb Williams that scare the heck out of me. Drake May, I haven't really heard that kind of talk, so I'm good if he's there, we take him. That's what I'm hoping. So there, there, there's there's Caleb Williams, who the expectation is will go one. Yes. And then the commanders will be choosing between Drake yeah. May, we would assume, and Jaden Daniels, right. the Heisman Trophy winner from LSU. And if you listen to Lewis uh, Riddick on our show yesterday, He thinks that he had one of the great seasons you'll ever see in college football last year, that he actually is as good a thrower of the ball as any of the prospects in this class. The only question about him is his frame. He is, uh, for lack of a better word, slight. Yep, and I think the last experience we had with a slightly built quarterback who made a big splash coming out was RG3, right. who had a very difficult time holding up. Now, I don't know if, if Daniels runs the ball, runs as much as RG3 did. He does. He's a good runner, yeah. He was going to take that hit, and I think that's what I look at when I see him. I, I worry about that scenario playing out all over again. Uh, I don't feel quite the same way about Drake May. A little bit bigger size, bigger in the frame, more of a pocket quarterback. I think that's what Washington fans are looking for. Daniels, by the way, is 6'4", so he's a little taller than RG3, but uh, he is thin. And and by the way, Greenberg, speak English. Don't say thrower of the ball. Nobody speaks like that. You could say passer, not thrower of the ball. 
That's ridiculous. Uh, Rex Minturn making a special guest appearance today, and uh, a young man who is actually uh, still a fan of this team despite the last 25 years under Dan Snyder. We've talked about this off the air, but uh, as things are moving along here, what's your feel on number two? Who who do you want, and who do you think they're going to wind up with? I think Drake May, Drake May. Yeah, but I think, ultimately, what do I know? I'm, uh, yeah. I'm trusting Adam Peters. I, I don't know either. Right, and that's that's what Legler says. He he trusts them, but. You know, you've had Tim Hasselbeck saying for months now, hey, May's the better quarterback here. And the big thing for me is the off-the-field stuff. Uh, you know, the, the, the father influence is, is scary to me, having seen what happened with RG3 here and Dwayne Haskins to maybe a lesser degree. Uh, when the father's involved in the process, it's not a great thing. Um, you know, look, uh, Mahomes... His dad's a professional athlete. You would think he would have been more involved. Now, he has some of his own personal problems. He was just recently picked up for his third DUI, uh, but he has stayed out of this process, and it's probably a good thing. Now, as to who is the better of the two between Jaden Daniels and Drake May, Chase Daniel, who didn't play a whole lot in the NFL but spent 14 years in quarterback rooms uh, basically as a as – a, clipboard holder, emergency quarterback. I think he made five starts during his career. Uh, now as an analyst with the NFL Network, here's his comparison between Jaden Daniels and Drake May. The dude, the dude can flat out play. Like he's exactly what I think an NFL offense needs in terms of his movement, getting out. Like he just has such a smooth stroke in my opinion. Like when you watch it, just a pure thrower. Now he's played a lot. He's played five years or six. He seems like he's been around forever. And I do think that the ceiling can still grow with him. And I think that's what scouts are excited about. I think he's a better athlete. He's, he is the best athlete of all the quarterbacks out there, in my opinion. And then you go to Drake May, who look, he's a red shirt sophomore. Uh, so he's only started two years, but he was captains. Both of those years, prototypical size, not as strong as an arm as I thought when I first started diving in on him. But I do think that the dude can spin it with the best of them. And I do think out of really Caleb, Jaden and Drake, Mm -hmm. I do think he's the most pro ready. Okay. And I think that's the, that's the consensus, but again, he's only started for two years and that would bother me a little bit. Uh, Whereas you might say also about, but Jaden Daniels, well, he's he's played a lot of football. You know, he's been to two schools. He's been in college for five years, made a lot of starts, taken a lot of hits. So you can look at it that way. Now, this is about the uh, the lack of an agent. This is uh, this again, Chase Daniel with uh, Caleb Williams not hiring an agent. Some would say, "Ooh, red flag could be a problem here." Uh, Daniel doesn't think it's a big deal. Like it's all slotted, right? So like, well, what are you really doing for an agent? He's going to save 3% on it. I, I get that. I, I don't really think it's that big of a deal. Okay. Now he probably has a lawyer or an attorney going to look over the contract, help him get it. Uh, and probably going big on the marketing firm, SC, NIL, all that stuff. So I don't necessarily know if you need to just give away 3% of your salary. Um, look, I, I am pro agent. Like I, I had one of the best agents of all time being able to get me some of these contracts that I was able to get Jeff Nally. He was select sports group. Now they're uh, with CAA under the CAA umbrella. Right. And, and I've always fought for agents. I was a, a voting rep for the, the NFL PA for 10 years. And, and I was always pro agent, but, and in this point, I, I don't see a red flag with that necessarily. No, I mean, like some people do. It, it's just, you know, you're going to save 3% on your first contract. Well, but what if he wants to go to Washington, right? Chase, what if he sits there and yeah. he, what, uh, honestly, what, what if he, what if he sits there and he vibes with uh you know the Giants? Yeah, these are things. He's like Rich is right about that. That's uh you know that that's Rich Eisen. He's he's it's scary. I, I I think things may work out the best if they just stay at two. Chicago, whether they take Caleb Williams at one or trade the pick, somebody's taking him at one. So uh, I I would not get into that, and I just I just think there are too many too many things that uh, especially for this franchise. Now I I can tell you this. Um, this, uh, this, this actually, uh, did happen when, uh, when the wizards were picking number four overall in 1995, I believe maybe no 1994. And, uh, and, and you had the situation with, uh, where they took, uh, Juwan Howard, 
Um, and why am I blanking on his name? The uh, the kid who came right out of high school, later played for the Celtics, spent most of his career with Minnesota. Not a kid. Garnett? Uh, Garnett, yeah. Yes, Kevin Garnett. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Garnett was, was coming out directly from high school into the pros, and this hadn't happened in a long time. And, you know, this was even before Kobe. And there was real hesitation as to, you know, do you want to take a guy who's a high schooler and may not be ready or do you take the more ready Juwan Howard? And because of the then bullet situation of flaming out on so many picks, uh, they wound up taking Juwan Howard. And and clearly, you know, they they whiffed on that. So you know, you 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 think this through as much as you can. Sometimes you're wrong. Sometimes you're right. But I would err on the side of caution uh, if I were Washington. Some uh, some college football stuff. Um, this was um, yesterday on PTI. Uh, Tony and Mike took a look at what. Um, Nick Saban has said about how he wants to fix college football. And I think he's – I think Saban's 100% right on this. It's It's got to go in this direction. And I've got a big story from CBS Sports to kind of back this up. Um, the game is, is in turmoil right now. And what Saban is suggesting and what Jay Billis said the other day is going to have to happen is the players are going to have to become employees of the school. The, this NIL collective nonsense, it's, it's just complete chaos right now. And what he said is, you know, let's have contracts for the players. And what Jay said the other day was sign them to multi-year deals and have buyouts in the deal. So if they want to go to another school and the other school wants them, they pay for the buyout. Or if the kid wants to get out bad enough, he pays for the buyout. You do this just the same as you do it with coaches. Coaches are coming and going wherever they want to go. They make big money. Why shouldn't the players be able to do it? And let's do away with this you know, so-called student-athlete nonsense where they're getting paid, but they're getting paid in a, in a way that – uh, is not going to really be sustainable, and I'll get to more details on that. But uh, this is uh, what Tony and Mike said about Saban's plan and what might be the motivation behind what Saban wants. He worries about the lack of continuity on teams because of the transfer portal. He worries that NIL money is becoming the goal and detracting from going to college to prepare for a career other than football. He says he's for the players and wants what sounds like compensation to be paid directly from the school to the players. Saban doesn't like these collectives that have sprung up, doesn't like them at all. Will Von, does Saban have the sway to get everyone on the same page? Tony, I don't know if he has the sway because college football supporters, boosters, are maniacs. I'm one of them. I, 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 so I'm accusing the group that I'm included in. I have had a brief conversation uh, with Nick Saban about this general area. Others have had longer conversations. I know he feels this way, and I agree with every syllable he spoke. Every syllable, all of it, all of it. The NIL portion, the transfer portion, the, the college football is, I worry, I'd go even further. It seems to me it's going to hell in the handbasket, even though it's so popular, it's right. more popular, and more people are coming into the tent. I worry about where it's going when you have entire regions who aren't really represented anymore. Let's just move this off the West Coast and go to the SEC and the Big Ten. I, I worry about all of it, and I think Nick Saban is a 1,000% right. right now. Let's get to the specifics of the question. Does he have the sway? Man, Tony, his argument is compelling. I think it's necessary. If there is anybody, Nick Saban's the guy. I just don't know that people are listening, Tone. College football boosters don't yeah. listen to much of anyone. They do their own thing. They want these collectives. They're not trying to abide by any new rules. And I don't know if even the great Nick Saban can sway them. So when I heard these quotes this morning, my first reaction was that ship, this ship had sailed already. That Nick Saban was, you know, when, when the ship moved out, right. Nick Saban was on the ship, and then he jumped off back to the dock, <laughs> and then he quit. Okay, and he quit because the new world order in college football is something that, that he cannot abide. Right. And we have friends who are college basketball coaches who in the last three to five years have gotten out too. And this is a common thing among older coaches who've had a certain amount of power. I don't specifically disagree with what Nick Saban has said generally. I think it's great to plan for a career other than football. But I would say this, Mike, that when Nick Saban recruited people to Alabama, he said, come to Alabama because you can go to the NFL from here. He didn't say come to Alabama because we got a great med school. Okay. So I, I like the message. I'm not sure I completely trust the messenger in this particular case. When Nick Saban says he's for the players, 
I'm not doubting that, but I think he's more for the coaches, Mike. I think he sees people who do what he did for so long that the, their power has changed. It has dissipated. And I think he is mostly empathetic with that. And you know how I felt about him yeah, for a long Tony, time. So I, I'm, I don't disagree with your analysis. I would say two things real quickly. Everybody ain't going to Alabama where he can send 50 kids off of a group to the NFL at some point. They're not going there. And they're going to, Tony, forget, Saban, I think, said specifically by the time they're 27, 28 years old. No, by the time they're 22. Because even some of the ones that go to the NFL, they're there two, three years. That's it. So they're not all going to Alabama. And Nick, Nick Saban understands that. And, Tony, I think he also understands that while he and their slightly younger guy, I mean, Davo Sweeney doesn't want to abide by some of this stuff either. The younger coaches, Tony, I think Nick Saban knows this. They're okay with it. They have grown up yeah. expecting yeah, different right. things out of college football and the culture that's that right. it is. And I think he that's gets right. that. I just, it, just, it feels to me, Mike, like a battlefield conversion. It feels like, oh, mm. let me think about this for a second. Because he's the greatest coach ever, and he got paid the most money when players weren't making any money. Yeah, yeah. so uh, in follow-up to that, CBS Sports did a long piece today on the coaching crisis, and a lot of the quotes come from Mike Loxley from the University of Maryland. Now, Loxley is 54 years old. He's worked his whole life for this. He's been an assistant at a variety of places. Uh, he had a shot as a head coach before in New Mexico, didn't work out, uh, got kind of rehabbed at Alabama under Nick Saban, and has done a very good job in six years at the University of Maryland, making bowl games the last three years and winning bowl games each of those three years. He said to CBS Sports, he said, I've been doing this 33, 34 years, and I'm like, I don't know if I have the energy for this. Think about that. I mean, this is when he's really just supposed to be getting the program off the ground, but the way things have evolved with this transfer portal and NIL, you're not coaching anymore. And in this big story... Uh, they talk about the 31 FBS head coaching changes this offseason. Some of the moves are unprecedented and really hard to explain. And it's a lot of movement to assistant jobs. Yeah, head coaching to assistant. Uh, no, none more surprising than Chip Kelly, who is the head coach at UCLA and goes to Ohio State to become the offensive coordinator. Jeff Halfley, head coach at Boston College, three years left on his contract, jump to the Green Bay Packers to become the offensive coordinator there. Two head coaches at group of five level, these are guys who are at a point where they hope to get to the big boy colleges, uh, Kane Womack of South Alabama and Maurice Linguist of Buffalo, they've left to become coordinators at Alabama. You don't you used to see coordinators at Alabama move to those jobs. It's not happening anymore. Another group of five head coaches, Sean Elliott of Georgia State, left to become mostly a position coach at South Carolina. Jerry Kill gave up his head coaching job at New Mexico State after a 10-win season to become a consultant at Vanderbilt and said, I like country music and I don't have to raise NIL money. <laughs> He's been doing this for 40 years. And, and that's what the job has become. And these guys just don't want to do it anymore. Now, the most high-profile one was... Jim Harbaugh, but he may have escaped just as the Calvary was was coming up on him, and he's got a head coaching job in the NFL with a great young quarterback. So that's that's a nice spot to be in. Uh, but you got uh, Jesse Minter; he was his defensive coordinator. Probably could have gotten a maybe a head coaching job at a mid major. Nope he's he's going to go with him to the Chargers for that. Uh, Ryan Grubb, who is the offensive coordinator at Alabama, he goes to Seattle now. These guys are finding that. You know, it used to be that you had a better life if you were in college because the season was shorter and you didn't have to work around the clock like these NFL coaches do to get game plans together. You, you know, you could have more of a balanced life. Yeah, there was recruiting involved, but you had assistance to do that. Well, now you're recruiting your own roster all the time. CBS Sports spoke with a wide swath of college coaches at different levels. Some requested and were granted anonymity due to the sensitive nature of the subject. What emerged from these conversations was a clear growing frustration at the increased transactional nature of college football coaching. More than one coach lamented the modern process, a high school junior wanting mid five figures, the going rate for a decent transfer of being 100000 to 150000 all of it cloaked in NIL benefits, which may not 
not even fit the definition of true NIL, fair compensation for name, image, and likeness that is not an inducement to attend a university. Of course it's an inducement to attend a university. Uh, One coach, not named, what has the college job become? You're dealing with paying your team, keeping your team happy. All my time is recruiting my own team, recruiting transfers, recruiting high school players. How do you manage your roster? You know, in fact, every coach contacted had a common refrain. One coach with Power 5 experience verbalized in the simplest terms why he left and what was going through the minds of his peers. I wanted to coach football again, which is essentially what Chip Kelly said. Um, One coach, uh, you know, this is more from uh, Loxley. He says, guess what? Our fans now just can't blame Coach Lox for not getting top recruits. They can help me recruit now. They can legally donate to NILs, to collectives that allow us to be competitive to get top players. Yeah, it's all about getting money now. And Loxley said, I would say the programs that are more in the middle, they don't survive. Just like businesses don't survive. You either want to be at the top of the food chain or at the bottom. I'm kind of eaten up by both sides. He's telling you here, this is a... You know, at Maryland, it's a little bit different than, you know, coaching at Alabama or Georgia or something like that. You know, you have a, a, a seven, eight, you have an eight win season, you get to a bowl game, people are happy. But he says, I promise you this, if I had an open checkbook like some places that we can compete, that we compete against, there's no doubt in my mind I'd be able to recruit a national championship team to Maryland because there are so many players in this area. He may be overrating his recruiting ability a bit, but he is pretty good at it. Um and he's suggesting that, and maybe this is what's going to happen, though, there's going to be under the table money no matter what. But he says, give us all the same. Give us $20 million, whatever the magic number is. You can use it how you see fit. I don't think that's really going to work. You know, you give each school $20 million, it goes back to really what it was in the past where, you know, the $50 handshakes that used to take place in the, uh, in, the, in the glory days of the Southwest Conference when I was in Texas and everybody knew who was cheating and who was doing what. Um, he says, they're paying players improperly through agents, one Power 5 coach explained. Now they're paying them through collectives. Where I think it hurts some schools is they think they can compete with the big boys. The toxicity of the environment, win at all costs, is troubling. Well, it's always been win at all costs, but now you have to come up with the cash to do it and – you know, that's that's a never ending battle. And uh, I, I told you I had a conversation with uh, Scott Van Pelt last week where he was talking about, you know, they're approaching boosters like at LSU who gave two million dollars last year. And they're coming back to him again and say, we, we're going to have to do that this year, too. And when does it stop? It doesn't. And these guys, no matter how rich they are, they're not going to be paying two million dollars a year to fund the football program. You know, that was sort of like a launch. So they're going to have to come up with something. And I think what Saban is suggesting is is the most most likely scenario and and that you're going to have to stop this hypocrisy and stop this student athlete nonsense. And that when you recruit a player to go to a college, he becomes a university employee and he has a contract just like the coaches. Every coach on the staff has a contract. And if that player wants to leave, there's a buyout for that. And the buyout can be paid by the school that wants him and or he could do it you know, himself. He could pay it out of out of the money that he has. But this is not sustainable the way this is going. And what Nick Saban is saying, he's you know, basically saying it w- with what he did and that he, he left coaching at a time when he looked great, sounded great, didn't sound like he'd lost any energy, did a great job coaching this team this year, just can't do it anymore. And and we're seeing it, at the, as Tony mentioned, at the, at the basketball level too. And really good column by Candace Buckner in the Post today about Rick Pitino, who she points out is a throwback to the time when coaches ruled the game with the flick of their tongue. It's not that way anymore. And you've seen all the old war horses go, Roy and Kay and Bayheim. They've all gotten out. And aside from Jim Laranega, who has, has flown under the radar because he's at Miami. That's not a really high-profile place. And he's still known as, oh, good old Jim Laranega from that mid-major George Mason. Well, very quietly, he's been killing it in the transfer portal, and he built the team that went to the Final Four last year at Miami. He's 73 years old. But Patino, he's from the old guard. He was 
from the glory days of the Big East and winning at Kentucky and winning at Louisville. And she writes, once upon a time, the larger than the game coach could have been a cult leader. He wielded so much control. Now the name, image, and likeness era and the transfer portal have shifted the balance of power. Patino, 71, is one of six septuagenarian head coaches at the D1 level. Those coaches have seen everything in basketball, everything except this era. Freedom of movement, players unionizing and earning salaries for their services, lucrative deals that still don't rectify the fact that they're unpaid labor. True. Well done. All right. Uh, We'll probably get back to this from time to time, and uh, it's a story that's probably heading to some kind of conclusion because there are court cases that are pending now but uh, it's it's a complete mess it's a complete utter chaotic mess coming up uh, we'll get to the capitals and tj oshi and what that situation is and terry bradshaw with some old school talk about football on the rich eisen show and where he ranks patrick mahomes we'll get to that and more as we continue it's the andy poland show espn 6 30 we start at nine every day we roll through the 10 o'clock hour and then stop i'm doing nine to 11 these days so we either have tony coming up at 11 like we do today and when tony's out mike callow fills in but we got a tony show Coming up at uh, 11 o'clock today, we spent some time in the last hour talking about the coaching crisis in college football. These guys are saying, hey, (laughs) this isn't what we trained to do. You know, we're recruiting our own roster all the time. We're trying to negotiate contracts with kids or juniors in high school for six figures. And and you see this this exodus of, of guys going from college to the pros. And you even see guys with head coaching jobs going to assistant jobs in college because they're actually getting to coach instead of doing all the other stuff. And, you know, you could say uh, paying the players has, has been the, the end of this. No, it really hasn't. It's the way it's done, and that's why they're going to have to come up with, uh, with contracts for them. But the coaching money doesn't seem to change. And uh, just saw this story about C- Steve Tarkeesian, coach at Texas. They have approved a contract for $10.3 million guaranteed this year through 2030. So he's got some financial security there. And what what really, to me, is most galling about this deal, he's eligible to earn more than $1.5 million in bonuses if the Longhorns win a national championship. If you're paying a guy $10.3 million a year, you expect him to try to win the national championship. Why do you reward him for essentially doing his job? It just shows you just how much money comes gushing in when you have a program of that level and how much money is available through what they're doing with the uh, with the expanded playoff, which we talked about this yesterday. It's going to be 12 next year. And they're already getting ready to expand to 14 before they've even done 12. And how long before you get to 24? And then, you know, once you get to 24, are you going to have like play-ins in Dayton? You know, you got to win a game on Wednesday to, to get to a matchup with like Alabama on Saturday. You know, maybe it's if, if the television money is what it is, why not? You know, and that's why these coaches are getting this kind of money and they're, they're doing all they can. It's like, you know, that they're, they're trying to hold up against this 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 um, this avalanche right now, which is which is happening, you know, with the NIL and the transfer portal. You're trying to hold it together, still trying to pretend they're student athletes, still trying to be, hide behind. No professionals pay them like professionals, work out contracts, have salary caps, do whatever you have to do. But it. The way this thing is going, it's it's not working now. And and to see a coach who could get one point three million dollars for essentially doing his job, right? If you're paying a guy ten million dollars, you expect him to be in the mix for the national championship. And if he doesn't deliver one in the next five years, you get rid of him, right? And and that's the, you should have that expectation at Texas, by the way. You know, the, the, the fact that they've been over the years around a 500 team is, has always been ridiculous to me because they have the best facilities in the country. And now that they're going to the SEC, well, what the heck, you know, you, you're, you're in there right now. So uh, you ought to be able to do this. You know, one of the things they, they also the reason that they're going to the 14, that they want to go to the 14. It's the Big Ten pushing behind this because they want four bids, <laughs> you know. 
<laughs> why not eight? Why not? You know, why why not have Maryland in with with eight wins? You know, and they may get to that with all those teams that are going in. Can you imagine that that that, that Maryland would be in the playoff? Well. You know, be more money for them. So I guess it would all work out. Capitals played last night, and uh, in a season that looked lost, uh, they're starting to heat up. Alex Ovechkin didn't have a goal last night. He's had eight in his previous eight games, but he did have an assist, and they beat the Tampa Bay Lightning 5-3. to three. And Spencer Carberry's team, which started off the year not only you know struggling, but struggling to score goals. At one point, they were in last in, in hockey and in, in goal scoring. And they're picking it up now, and uh, he seems to be barely pleased with the way things are going. We're just fighting. We're, we're scratching, clawing, and uh, Penalty Guilt did, did an unbelievable job tonight against the uh, best power play in the National Hockey League. So uh, give our guys a lot of credit for just fighting for every inch tonight and staying composed in, this, in the situation in a hostile environment and um, finding a way to w- win a game in a really difficult we're, we're losing guys left, right, and center. And, uh, finding a way to get two points in, in, a, in a really tough building to play in. And one of those guys that they lost last night was T.J. Oshie, who had to crawl off the ice in the third period. And in hockey, I've noticed this mostly anecdotally over the years, but when you hear coaches talk about injuries, it's never a big deal. It's, they're always day-to-day, and it's lower body and it's upper body. This is a non-contact injury with a guy crawling off the ice. I'm not... You know, I have no idea about this, but when you hear non-contact injury in football and a guy can't put any weight on his leg, it's, you know, it's knee or ankle or, or Achilles. Um, but when you hear a coach, this is, this is the most alarming thing because the coach usually downplay these things. Uh, when Carberry was asked about the level of concern about this, he said this. Uh, I'd say it's fairly high. I mean, it's, uh, we'll evaluate, but. I'll know more tomorrow, but it's never a good sign when you see um, a player leaving the ice like that. Mm, fairly high. Fairly high in hockey means amputation. <laughs> Just about. Uh, I, I don't mean to make light of that, but that's, you know, when you when you hear a coach say that. Now, Oshi posted after the game, he said, I'll be back. Thanks for the love caps. Hashtag no bad days. Sounds like, you know, probably a season ender, I would think. Um, they've got some games left. They're uh, now five points out of the final playoff spot, and this is this has been a really tough stretch for them playing these, these games so close together. Got another game tomorrow at Florida, but um, you know, in a, in a year where it's possible, I was talking about this last week or the week before. There have been a few years along the way where we've just had awful teams top to bottom. And we may have in this calendar year of 2024 not a single team in the postseason. Uh, the college basketball hope. Now, George Mason had a huge win the other night. You know, they may sneak in. I don't know. That's, that's a possibility. Uh, Maryland is not going to the tournament. They'd have to win five games in five days in the Big East to get there. That's not happening. Obviously, Georgetown's not going to be in the uh, in the postseason. Maryland women, maybe they've picked things up a little bit, but you got the Wizards <laughs> joke. Um, Nats, they didn't spend any money this year, so twenty twenty four is not going to be, barring a miracle, is not going to be a postseason year. So the Capitals, you know, if they can get into the playoffs, that might be the only team that gets there uh, from from Washington uh, this year. They might be the only team. That makes it. Uh, As for the Wizards from last night, (laughs) I mean, this this was Scott Van Pelt. You know, he is he is a Wizards fan. He's he lives here, uh, does his show from here. As uh, as he was doing his NBA wrap up last night, here's how he wrapped up this latest game from Denver. Denver's going to win this one by 20. Gordon Jokic, 21 points, didn't miss on 10 attempts. To go with the 15 assists and the 19 rebounds. Wizard 9 and 46, Steve. Not very good. <laughs> Jokic, his fourth career triple double on 100% shooting, the most by any player in NBA history, even Wilt Chamberlain. In fact, breaks a tie with Wilt for the most of any player. Draymond Green, the only other with more than one of those games. 
Yeah, 21 points. Missed the free throw. Okay, 21 points, 19 rebounds, 15 assists in 31 minutes. I mean, they're, they're, just, they're just walking dead here. And Jordan Poole finally got benched. He seems disinterested. He did have 18 points off the bench. It was 4 of 17. Uh, I didn't see this quote, Rex. You, you said you saw a quote from him uh, after the game. What did, uh, what did Poole yeah, say? Yeah, I'll pull it up. Yeah, he said, he said um, you know, obviously he's not happy about coming off the bench uh, for that. But, uh, you know, I mean, if, if you're not going to be interested in playing, not even defense, um, and then th- this is – this is what the, the new coach said. Uh, Keefe is his name. He says, it's a really positive. It's actually a credit to Jordan. Jordan's been one of our highest net ratings since I've taken over. I just want to see more of that. This gives him an opportunity now, being in that unit, to be the lead leader, lead handler, excuse me, lead decision maker, and be kind of our offensive engine. Are you kidding me with this guy? A leader of what? He He's... He's Golden State dumped him. They 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 unloaded him here, and they were happy to take him on because he was supposedly going to give him you know some scoring, so they might be a little bit exciting. He's turd. What do you say after the game? If there's any common sense with the situation, you should know how I feel. But I'm just going to come out, do what I can do to help the team keep it moving. Yeah, yeah. You kept it moving right. They were down 23 at the half. They lost by 20. Um, <laughs> God, they play at uh, Oklahoma City uh, tomorrow night. That's another good team. And it's just like they, they, they fall out of it early. The other team gets to rest their, their players, and they just move on. What a, what a ridiculous season this is. Not that, you know, not that it's in the long run a bad thing, not something that's, uh, that's necessarily going to uh, you know, hurt them in the future. It's probably going to help them. They'll be in the lottery. But – I don't know what they're they're building with these guys, and and the problem with Poole is you can't trade him. He's got this. Was he got three years left after this year? I think he's got three years. You can't can't deal him. Um, I, I I got this the other day, and this is about uh, about the baseball. Some, you know, there is some positive. Barry Zerluga wrote a column about this uh, the other day about the learners not selling the team that we have seen them spend in the past, and uh, maybe they're going to do that again. And because of the way the Masson deal uh, seems to be going right now, um, you know, you're going to have a new owner in, in Rubenstein, and it's unclear exactly what happens to the Masson deal. But, but basically, as a cable network, it's worthless now. The, the, what, what it was in 2005 isn't anymore. The way streaming is going, um, it's, it's a loser. And so maybe they just disband it. And that allows the Nats to make their own TV deal, maybe with Ted with Monumental. That would make sense because he needs the uh, needs the programming, and uh, and they would be in a much better situation than having to battle the Orioles in court all the time. Uh, now there are older people like me who have cable, and you know, do, do you want to be in a situation if you're the Nats and the Orioles that you're off uh, cable TV? Probably not. But it, the way it's going, it's, it seems to be going in a streaming direction, and they're going to bundle that and, and be a part of that. And the Masson thing, which you know, looked like it made sense 20 years ago, doesn't anymore. But you also have this, and this is a story that was done by BizNow. This is uh, Elliot BizNow, who uh, has had a, a website for a long time about local business. And uh, it's a story about what has happened to the Learner Empire, which was built on, hello, office buildings and shopping malls, which are basically dead. And it says the Lerner family owns millions of square feet of older office buildings, which have come under intense pressure since the onset of the pandemic, requiring big investments to stay competitive. Lerner Enterprises hasn't announced any acquisitions, sales, renovations, or new office leases since 2022. Uh, and I drive by this fairly often, White Flint, which, when it opened, was like one of the jewel malls of America, high-end stores, place you wanted to be. It's, it's, it's all been torn down. Even Lord & Taylor, which was the last survivor, wound up getting $30 million from the learners because in the lease agreement that they signed, which was 100 years, that the lease said there'd be a shopping mall around them, and it wasn't. It was all torn down, and now they're, they're gone too. And they're just in a position now with the way the economy is and the way things have gone uh, post-pandemic and even before that with the shopping malls, 
you know, it's not a, it's not a it's not a good business to be in now. Now they they built a big empire here, so there's there's money in reserve. But it says in the story, the family of Annette Lerner, Ted's widow, who helped him found the real estate company in 1952 and is a principal owner of the Nationals, has a net worth of $6.4 billion, according to Forbes. A group of five siblings and siblings-in-law, Ted and Annette's son, Mark Lerner, daughters Deborah Cohen and Marla Tannenbaum, and their husbands, Ed Cohen and Bob Tannenbaum, have reportedly acted as the brain trust behind the baseball team. So they got a shrinking empire here. They're working as the brain trust, and that's why you saw the biggest acquisition of the offseason was a $5 million player who hit 197 career. Um, so you have that. Now you also have the, the Strasburg contract, which is a complete embarrassment now because uh, he wants to retire. He can't pitch anymore, and they're going to make a dog and pony show out of him, making him show up at spring training to, to supposedly be – an instructor. Move on. He's owed $105 million. Move on. Uh, much of Lerner's pro- portfolio was concentrated in the types of properties that have faced distress over the last decade. Malls, office buildings, and the firm has suffered one prominent loss, Dulles Town Center, which essentially they just had to turn over the lease. Uh, its value when it was turned over was $55 million, down from $184 million in 2018. Uh, office vacancy rate is 22% in suburban Maryland, uh, D.C., almost 19%. Um, no, these are not good numbers. Um, they One building sold in December for $9.5 million, down from its 2020 price of $31 million, and one prominent Bethesda office tower sold for one-fifth of its sale price from 2019. This is what they're, what they're having to do right now. So when they bought the team... They were swimming in money from all these real estate holdings and everything else they had. And it, it made sense to, you know, make some of the deals that they made. And, and in fact, the Max Scherzer deal, which I'm told didn't involve Mike Rizzo, that was uh, Ted Lerner working uh, strictly with Scott Boris, that turned out to be a great deal. $210 million, which was the biggest at the time. It, incur- it, it included a lot of deferred money, which is the way things are going with these Shohei Atani contracts. I don't think, I don't think they can do this anymore. Uh, The White Flint sale in North Bethesda, once home to 125 retailers, has been sitting fenced in in a vacant, bustling intersection across from Pike and Rose since 2015. Lerner lost a $31 million lawsuit against Lord & Taylor for its partial demolition of the mall. The 45-acre site was reportedly up for the Amazon headquarters, but they lost out on that. So um, it's not a rosy picture here, and and I just wonder, the Lerner's, choosing to hang on to the Nationals, did they do that because that's one of the few things that they own that's an appreciating asset and everything else, as a, is laid out in this story here, is going way down in value, selling for a fifth of the price, having to turn over leases to the banks, things like that. So it, 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 it is going up in value because of the way sports franchises go up in value, uh, none more than the NFL, of course. But uh, that might be a reason they're doing it. But if you're hoping that they're going to spend money and you read this story, it doesn't sound like they're in a position to really spend. And it operates differently in baseball than other sports because there's no salary cap. So you spend what you want to spend. And that's why the Dodgers do that. Some of it's related to the television money that they have, but they have deep pockets. They can do that. The Yankees can do that. The Red Sox and the learners they may have been able to do that 15 years ago when they built a World Series team, and they're going to be able to dine out off that for a while. But if you're looking for them to necessarily spend money, like Barry Zerluga writes that they might be able to do, doesn't sound promising. Coming up, Terry Bradshaw talking to Rich Eisen. Some old-school stuff from Bradshaw and what he thinks of Patrick Mahomes. We'll get to that and more as we continue. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630, the sports capital. We got Tony coming up at 11 o'clock today on this kind of uh, eh, kind of a gray day, but uh, okay. Weather pretty warm, 58 degrees today. Not too bad. Not too bad. Terry Bradshaw showed up on the Rich Eisen show yesterday. And uh, I don't know. Bradshaw's in his 70s. Um, there is reason to believe that they're probably ready to move on from him at some point at Fox. I don't know what his contract situation is for next year, but he's, he's still pretty entertaining. And uh, I like his self-deprecating humor 
and things like that. And I think he's really good with Howie Long. They put him next to each other, and they make kind of a good yin and a yang. So um, this is kind of late for this. It's Super Bowl follow-up a couple of weeks later. But um, this was Bradshaw and an interesting question about MVP for the Super Bowl. And should perhaps, I don't don't think it'll ever happen because the way it works is almost always the quarterback wins and uh, very rarely will a defensive player uh, win a game, win a MVP. But he he's wondering maybe it should go to a coach at some point. And, you know, as we move further and further away from what Joe Gibbs did and we look at dynasties, you know, maybe we should rethink some of those. Now, he wouldn't have gotten it when Doug Williams did what he did in the middle one. Um, in the first one, yeah, I'm, I'm, you had to give it to John Riggins. He made the play of the game, and he set the record. Didn't last very long, just a year. Marcus Allen broke it, but most yards in a Super Bowl, so he was going to get it. Uh, but maybe the third one, you know, Mark Rippon was good. Was he spectacular in that game? No, it was it, the defense was excellent, and they ran the ball. And if you look, I mean, I know we're going back a long time here. This is over 30 years, but if you were to Look at that game again closely, and you were, would consider a coach. You might consider Joe Gibbs because he won a Super Bowl with not the worst. I think there probably was somebody worse, but Mark Rippon was a, was, had one spectacular year. Otherwise, he was a journeyman guy, you know, made some starts with other teams, had a pretty decent year in 1990. But if you look at that in the rearview mirror, might you give the MVP to the coach for that? So when you get to Andy Reid, who won his third one uh, earlier this month, this is what Bradshaw says, and, and I think it's, uh, it's worth considering. I, th- I think America appreciates him more and more and more. He's getting uh, – he's in his 60s, and uh, he's a little chubby guy, and uh, he stands <laughs> over on the sideline with that mustache – we see that I have the vision of the of it frozen <laughs> so, in the in the playoff game, and you just have so much respect from his, his offensive mind. And when you when a person says offensive mind, all you're talking about is formations, all these formations, and all this movement to create that one on one or 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 that um, uh, confusion uh, on a defense and. Uh, I just thought I thought Andy Reid was just brilliant, you know, in this football game. Have they ever given the MVP to a coach? I know, you right? About, I hey, know. Have you ever thought about that? No, I know. I don't. I, I I don't believe so. But I I understand. Uh, MVC, yeah. the most valuable coach in the game, you know, and he's an, he's an he's an old school guy too. But yes. but he does relate to the current players in a way that um that is the envy of of many, and and he's able to I guess let things roll off his back in real time. I imagine you never went up to Chuck Knoll and gave him an earful like Travis Kelsey did in the middle of the game to uh, to read, right, Terry? You never did that to Chuck? No, I never. No. Are you kidding? <laughs> no, I never did that. I, first, let me explain something to you, Rich. Once again, yes, sir. I called my own play, so I didn't have anybody to deal with nice. but myself. All right? So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> The, hey, hey, listen, I know some people out there are watching this going, well, well, that arrogant guy. No, no, folks, you don't understand. You know, us guys that played in the 70s, we're so far the, down the totem pole when it comes to ranking quarterbacks because our numbers are so hideous and our interceptions are so high. So we reach and grab for anything we can, can get to remain, you know, uh, constant, you know, and uh, – I didn't. I would. I never did, and nor would I ever have uh, gone and done that to Chuck Noll. I did take his hands off of me one time and throw him down because he he had a habit of grabbing me, but he wouldn't try to make a point. Well, I knew he was trying to make a point, but didn't need to grab me. And I remember taking his hands and throwing them down. When t- <laughs> how did he take that? Uh, he took it fine. Okay. He took it by him. Yeah, he understood. Hey, Chuck, smart man. He understood. He did the battle. It's it's like um, Travis Kelsey. I felt bad for Andy because Andy had had hip surgery. Yeah. Uh, he had his game plan in his hand. And when Kelsey went over, Kelsey didn't push him. I think Kelsey 
Kelsey went over and bumped accidentally bumped him. I don't yes. think he pushed him or anything. It was an accident, but it looked bad on television. And I felt bad, bad for Andy. As a matter of fact, when the game was over, I text Andy. He immediately, get this, he he immediately texts me back. And um, I said, way to go. You know, played great defense for th three quarters, four quarters, got in overtime, turned it over to number 15 and win the game. And uh, he was well, he was quick to respond and very gracious in his response. Nothing about Kelsey. And Kelsey felt bad. And it's over. They won the football game. Yes, they did. Uh, now, the Chuck Knoll relationship, if you're not familiar with it, they had great success together. They won four Super Bowls, but they never really made up. It was it was a, uh, it was a difficult marriage, let's put it that way. And, uh, and Bradshaw left, and he wasn't very gracious about it. He had all that success winning four Super Bowls, going to the Hall of Fame, and he and Chuck Knoll just didn't see eye to eye. Knoll really didn't like him. He didn't like Knoll, but... <laughs> You know, and somehow it worked out that the, the sad part was that they, they really couldn't put it all behind them. And when Bradshaw went into the Hall of Fame, he didn't I don't even know if Chuck Noll was there, but he didn't have him present him. It was uh, it was Vern Lundquist, who was his TV broadcast partner at the time. Seemed odd, seemed very, very odd. But uh, it's an interesting point that he brings up about possibly naming a coach uh, the MVP of the Super Bowl. This is part two. Um and this is this is old guy talk. I know that, and and I'll get to uh, where his numbers are versus quarterbacks of today, including Mahomes, in uh, in just a minute. But this is this is an era that he played in. The Steelers were built on defense. They had great defensive teams. They had uh, great running backs led by Franco Harris, Rocky Blyer, uh, offensive line. They were there was old school football. It was it was pound the rock. And it was played great defense. He had, you know, Hall of Fame receivers, but Lynn Swan, for his career, caught like 350 balls. You know, <laughs> that's that's a good couple of seasons now in the NFL. So things were different. And uh, this is Bradshaw on the era that he played in versus the one now. Hey, you better be a big boy. So uh, you're going to get your ass handed to you. And uh, it was no faint of heart there, boy. It was a, a different football game completely. Not to say that these guys wouldn't be outstanding. Sure. If we, if they played, uh, say, if Mahomes played for Pittsburgh, his numbers wouldn't, they would, I, I don't think they'd be any different because they just, you know, when you average 19 passes a game, you're, they're not going to be different. Uh, they do 19 passes in the first two series now. I know. Uh, I know. Just it's a different era. And, I, and sometimes I... And I, I say to my wife, Tam, who's on the other side of the of the computer here, and I say all the time, you know, I wish I'd played in this era so that I could have, you know, proven that I, you know, I'm I'm not a 52% completion guy. I'm a much higher than I would be with the offenses they run and could throw for all the yardage and have all the touchdowns. And then everybody is, oh, man, he was so good. And then you say, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm okay where I am. You sometimes wish that young people would realize it. See, I I remember Bart Starr in the first two Super Bowls. I remember Namath when he in the when they won the Super Bowl in what was it, 69 or 70 and in the merger of the NFL in 69, forced the forced the merger actually. Mm -hmm. So I, I remember that. I remember playing against John Hadel, George Blanda. I played against Bart Starr. And the, the way the game was played back then in it's not to say that it wasn't great football, but it was. I thought the first three quarters of the Super Bowl this year, 58, I thought was defense. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, I know America sitting back there going, boy, this is boring. But it was so good to watch and see the strategy and how great both defenses were. Quick to the ball. I mean, if you like great football, that was great football. Well, it was in the 70s. And, uh, He's rounding up just a little bit when he says he was a 52% uh, completion guy. 51.9. Uh, the, the, here's, here's the numbers, and I, I really this, you look at these numbers and, and you realize w how different football was in the 70s than it is now. Uh, Bradshaw in his career played in 168 games. He made 158 starts. The completion percentage, 51.9. He threw 212 touchdowns, 210 interceptions the most touchdowns he threw in a season 
was 28 in 1978. The most yards he threw for in a season was 3,700 in 1979. Patrick Mahomes, who's only been a starter for six years, he's been in the league for seven years, played behind Alex Smith his first year, didn't play, I guess, in only one game. Uh, he's made 96 starts. So Bradshaw, 158. Mahomes, 96. Bradshaw completion percentage, 51.9. Mahomes, 66.5. He has already thrown seven more touchdown passes than Bradshaw threw in his whole career. And Bradshaw was known as the blonde bomber, okay? So he had, for his career, 212. Mahomes already has 219, only 63 interceptions. A little more than a third of what Bradshaw threw in his career. Uh, The most touchdown passes he threw in a season was 50 in 2018. That's when they were still playing 16 games. Bradshaw played uh, more than half of his career. Uh, with 16 games. The most yards that he threw for in a season was last year, 2022, not this past season, uh, 5,250 yards. Okay, it was 17 games. But in 2018, he threw for 5,097 in a 16-game schedule. The most that uh, Bradshaw ever threw for was 3,700. So different times, different era. Here is his analysis of what he sees in Patrick Mahomes and where he'd rank them. I always rank quarterbacks according to winning uh, Super Bowls. Um, Brady, obviously. Montana, obviously. Great quarterbacks. And they always put Unitas in there. Uh, nobody ever says anything about star. It's a different kind of way of playing. I would put Mahomes up there right now simply because he reminds me so much of Brady. In the sense, he is so fiercely competitive and so and, and so amazingly confident in everything he does. And a great leader, you can see that. So if I put Mahomes and Brady, Mahomes will give me the mobility to avoid sacks. Uh, outside of that, then you've got Tom down there reading coverages and uh, between the one and two. One's more athletic. They're both extremely accurate, both extremely <laughs> You know, confidence. I would I would say in the modern day of football, as we know it now, in the last twenty years, uh, then I would say I would I would probably take um, Mahomes just because of his athletic ability. Um, but it's hard to say the other guy's got seven seven Super Bowl titles, and Patrick is about to experience. He thought this year was tough. Wait till next year. Everybody will be after him. I tried to go for three Super Bowls in a row twice. Hey, Rich, it's exhausting. Everybody wants a piece of you. Everybody plays above what they're capable of playing. I mean, and you feel the pressure. Uh, there's a part of you that says, oh, my God. I got to play Cleveland again, Cincinnati again, Houston, all these teams. Let's get to the playoffs because all you want to do is get to the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened to Kansas City this year. They're flummelling around looking bad. We're all going, what's wrong with Kansas City? And I'm going, nothing wrong with Kansas City. They're bored. (laughs) (laughs) They want to get to the playoffs. And that'll be the same approach, Rich, they'll have next year. They'll struggle. They're going to probably struggle worse than they did. They'll probably have to go on the road again because Denver's going to be better. You, I guarantee you the Chargers are going to be better. Um, the Raiders with Pierce leading the way, they're going to be better. It is not going to be e- easy in their in their division. So I'm, they're going to have a hard time. But bottom line is, they're going to want to get through all of that, and they're going to say that we just just get us in the playoffs. And if they get in the playoffs next year, they, I think they're if they make the playoffs next year, I think they're going to be the first team to win three Super Bowls because I don't know who can beat them in the NFC. I just don't. They're going to have to get through, of course, Baltimore too. So it's going to be fun to watch. I'm already. I mean. A couple of weeks out now, I'm, you know. I'm kind of you like, and me both, Terry. I'm ready to go, you know. Yeah, he's uh, he's still got it. Still got the enthusiasm for him. Uh, the, the point he makes about uh, the how hard it is to three-peat. Again, I go back to the Buffalo Bills. They didn't win one, but going to four straight is really incredible. I mean, just to, it's, I think it's more incredible than repeating because you got to pick yourself off the carpet and you got to get back into it and get yourself motivated again. And to get back now, they really were outmatched in three of them. The first one they had a chance to win. And if Scott Norwood kicks that field goal, who knows? 
But uh, the last three, they were really, you know, overtaken by Dallas and, and Washington and the one before that. So uh, as they go for three in a row, that's a really good point that Bradshaw makes. And I'll tell you something else about this schedule. Once they go to 18 games, coaches are going to have to rethink about how they jockey their teams into the playoffs because it's just so hard to get yourself motivated every week. Bradshaw laid it out there, you know, that that each week – you're, you're looking at these teams, some of them you're way better than, and you go, well, let's just get out of this, get on, so we want to get to the playoffs and get to the postseason. And I think, you know, they'll, they'll get there next year, but he's saying that he doesn't think they're going to go through it at home. Now, this was a year where they were supposed to be sort of rebuilding. Um, and, you know, can they get another great year out of Travis Kelsey? Uh, how much is the Taylor Swift thing going to f- carry over for another year? Is she going to be back for all this? And, and is that going to start to wear people out after a while? Uh, and then, as Nick Saban says, the, the biggest enemy to success is success. That when you've won two in a row, you know, you, you tend to ease up a little bit. Now, this team doesn't, this isn't the 85 Bears who, you know, really got caught up in themselves and, you know, were doing commercials. All These guys do commercials, but they still win. Um, and and if they can keep their focus. But that's that's the next thing. That's the next frontier is is going for three. And a, nobody's the closest we'll ever have. I don't I, I just can't imagine, especially now with a 17 game schedule and likely within, I think, a couple of years, an 18 game schedule with all the money they make on television. What what the New England Patriots did when they went 18-0, uh, I don't think we'll see that again. Uh, yes, you could celebrate the Dolphins as the only undefeated team, 17-0 and all that. But uh, even though they didn't get there, they were a helmet catch away. David Tyree doesn't make that catch. They win that Super Bowl. They're 19-0, and and that's, that's the next frontier. And I don't think anybody gets there. But three in a row may be doable, maybe. But as Bradshaw said, that's how hard it is to get there. All right. Thanks to Rex for being here today. Uh, thanks to Lucas Bartlett of D.C. United. They got a game against the New England Revolution at Audi Field tomorrow night. And thanks to all of you who listened. I will see you back here Monday morning at 9 a.m.